Today I want to talk to you about your health. And being a nurse for hmm, a few years now, this is not surprising. Yet if I said I want to talk to you about your digital health, then that might be. That would be because most people don't mention digital health, don't even know what it is. Yet your health and your digital health are one and the same. Think about why. Guy comes into the emergency room confused after hitting his head in an auto accident. And he lands in an urgent care and isn't really able to say much. Can we pull up his medical record where his data is? A few miles from home in the emergency room, same question. Can we pull up his medical record? Several states away on vacation, probably not. So where's the data? And how effective is our treatment likely to be? As it stands, should he come to consciousness even for a while, we're limited to a very compromised self-report of medical history at best or a history not at all at worst. According to the World Health Organization, digital health is a broad umbrella term encompassing e-health as well as emerging areas such as the use of advanced computing sciences in big data, genomics, and artificial intelligence. Digital health constituted the primary means for care delivery and changing to digital health venues happened overnight during the COVID-19 pandemic. And when we say big data, it means that healthcare providers now work from huge databases of tens of thousands, millions, even billions of data pieces, which require new methods of analysis in artificial intelligence and machine learning. In that glut of data is your individual health data, often compared to a benchmark of data from many, many others who have a similar condition, diagnosis, or other things in common like molecular structure. Each time we log into the health provider sites, have an encounter with the provider, or send and receive messages with them, data is generated. Looking just at frequencies and looking at what's happened over the past year or so, since the outbreak of COVID-19, the use of digital health services has soared, especially in the United Kingdom and the United States. Some caveats. The UK National Health Service, NHS, experienced a 912% increase in the use of their app, NHS Digital, in 2020. The novel UK messaging tool, NHS Mail, generated over 100 billion chat messages to its users and hosted over 24 million meetings. Similar striking rises in telehealth visits occurred in the U.S. with a 154% increase found when comparing two periods early in 2019 and 2020. Remember, telehealth and its related tools like chatbots and RPM, remote patient monitoring, are not just about convenience, it's about the data. So when trying to look back and say what really happened, it's hard to summarize, but the Chief Operating Officer of HIMSS, the Health Information Management System Society, said it best. He said, in this pandemic, we pretty much had to blow up the classic encounter-based paradigm of health. We had to create a situation where clinicians, physicians, and nurse practitioners could, in fact, talk to people not inside the walls of the clinic, but to accelerate areas of telehealth and digital health communications. And we had to do so quickly. And that, frankly, is not the forte of the healthcare ecosystem. It doesn't move quickly, and this time we had to. So the benefits of digital health are many. Reduced costs, in, reduced in, inefficiencies, improved access, better quality, more personalized or precise diagnostic and treatment encounters, at least according to the FDA. Digital health technologies, chiefly telehealth services, accessed through smart devices, often involve streaming media, video conferencing, wireless communication, yet much more than a one-for-one -one replacement of a traditional face-to-face -face interaction, telehealth sessions carry with them other advantages, such as additional touch points of care and additional data points, which strengthen patient engagement, consumer choice, and algorithm training and validation for disease management. So it's this convergence of technology and care provision that fit together now, kind of like fist and glove, and they really are inseparable. Mm -hmm. And you thought the old idea and term, doc in the box, was about convenience. It was, it is, and now it's about much, much more. Every time we dial into the healthcare provider, your doctor, your nurse, your nurse practitioner, data is organized into a final form called actionable data. Data about the patient, so the self-report, the HPI, that's the history of the present illness, signs and symptoms, advice, a prescription, but it's about much, much more now. The data too is about the encounter itself. How long did it take? Is this a repeat visit? Was video instruction offered? So what does 
machine learning in healthcare really look like? Machine learning and natural language processing in healthcare on Data Science Central's blog, it's the image of what's going on behind the scenes in the brain, if you will, of the healthcare system, or the hospital, or the outpatient clinic, or the doctor's office. The nurse and doctor are there, I promise you. Look at all the data in the picture on the left. The EMR, electronic medical record, has data, images, lab results, everything from your blood sugar, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, numbers. So structured data. Also clinical notes, so a narrative on, it's a lot of data for even just one patient times all the patients hospitalized everywhere over time. And this is indeed big data, also known as humongous data. Well, how does one make sense of it? Well, one doesn't. One nurse or doctor needs help from machine learning. On the right, we see an image of a neural network. Note the second column shows what's being searched for by computer algorithms, hidden patterns. Things we providers aren't even looking for, don't ask about, don't know to look for. So here's a friendlier picture, if you will, of data analytics techniques experts use to analyze that wealth of humongous data. So for professors and students out there, anywhere, traditional science and hypothesis testing, represented by that blue circle called statistics, is now supplemented in clinical decision making through data analytics methods. Some are referred to here collectively under KDD, knowledge discovery and databases. Some specific analytic techniques under that are neural networks, including pattern recognition, nearest neighbor, SVM or support vector machine, decision trees and random forest. The volume of data alone is a reason traditional statistics is not enough for the analysis of big data, as it's called, but there are other reasons as well, like the velocity or the speed at which the healthcare data comes at us. Another is the variety of places the big data in healthcare comes from, including administrative record like one's zip code or occupation. Pattern recognition is an important feature of machine learning in healthcare. Recently, researchers learned that remnants of the RNA of the coronavirus is shed in the gastrointestinal system so that sewage data will show early signs of the presence of COVID in a community as much as seven to 10 days prior to an actual outbreak. So there's a pattern brought to us by machine learning, again, one that we were not looking for. So where is the provider in all of this? Providers, that's physicians and nurses, are not going to be replaced by machine learning, but helped by their proper use. So as a provider, I don't need to know intimately all the techniques I just rattled off, but I do need to know that those things are running behind the scenes in the electronic healthcare system in order to support clinical decisions, and that these analytic tools are something that is worthy of my trust. So here's another name now for COVID-19, and interestingly, the great accelerator of digital health. Every aspect of digital delivery of care, digital interaction and care encounters, digital this, digital that, has all changed and there's no going back. COVID-19 has catapulted the world's healthcare provision into an exponential change, the meteoric rise of digital health, so you must become an E or electronic patient as the dominant mode, not the only mode, but the dominant mode of healthcare delivery. We know people are afraid, where's my data going? Where the day is coming, in fact, that maybe I can only do this digitally. So today, though, we can selectively share, including with healthcare providers. We can also use password managers to keep things safe, double authentication when accessing care digitally, and I can secure my own wireless networks, both at home and in the workplace. And those things keep me safe. For doctors, patients, and engagement, there's no going back to the old way, not exclusively anyhow. Uh, it's not the first way to do business either. Although the doctor's offices, nurse practitioner's offices, they'll continue to be full, at least in the short run. Many of us will engage digitally, almost on demand, whenever we are, wherever we are, and whenever there's a device available to us. There's no going back to the old days where once or twice yearly doctor's office visit is the norm. It was doctor-centric, it kept the insurance companies happy, sort of. It was about not necessarily the patient-consumer. It also had waiting times that were long paper, missed appointments. It was reactive and the patient was passive. It was all packed in. Today, a scribe helps with that, but it was very hurried. And in my experience, it was never really about the TV doctor like on ER, Grace Anatomy, Marcus Welby, or any of the TV doctors. 
the technology is already there to notify us that there is a doctor available to see us when we have placed our appointment desired in a window of time. There are accommodating, meaning safe, HIPAA or healthcare privacy laws and apps that go with, like Spruce, which I've used myself. So we are or will become e-patients, all of us. For digital health, Look at this humorous picture of which way are you going. You have to ask yourself, which kind of e-patient are you? Friend of mine, no names, goes to her doctor and plunks down a piece of hardware. What's inside? Um, blood sugars. The uh, retrieval and archiving of health information is in something hardware. It's not connected to much of anything. But in the picture on the right, Mr. Murphy can find his way to swat at the uh, games he likes with his paws. Well. Not quite, really. He seems knowledgeable. You are needed to move from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. So I want you to ask yourself, which way are you going? Our healthcare system moves from one which values transaction to one which embraces interaction. Nurses and physicians will need to reimagine their contribution, moving beyond caregiver to innovator, technologist, and advocate as well. But the advocacy really begins with you. So there's a few things wrong with this picture that kind of are addressed in the next one. And that is how all this data for you as an individual might work. The data is about you and precisely you and can be gathered rapidly and in real time, but not with hardware and not with paper. Feeding into the system with rapid, if not instantaneous results and medical actions. Also, patients are coming to doctors with everything from a DNA report to output from wearables like EKG tracings, patterns with gait and posture. And this is what we call precision medicine. In 45 years of nursing, and if it's taught me nothing else, it's this. We talk a lot about highly individualized care, yet cohort medicine and strata medicine is still being practiced. Your data should, and treatment should not be about data and samples of 50 guys with heart failure who are not like you, um, 100 women who gave birth last year at the local hospital who are not like you, or cohorts or strata of samples of people who may or may not be like you. Strata or cohort medicine, one disease entity, people uh, sometimes share molecular signatures and we should be grouped that way instead of by disease or by diagnosis or ICD-10 codes. So this old way is what we mean by one size fits all, and I call it one size fits no one medicine. I want you to know the power's in your hands. Remember, your device is your decision, and to be an e-patient and fully engaged, it's your decision, your device, and your data. With these digital venues comes real engagement, and that is the customer's future pr proactive relationship with healthcare providers as an e-patient. The Precision Medicine Project from the NIH, the National Institute of Health, is called All of Us. The goal is to enroll over one million people living in the United States and that those enrollees truly represent the entire population of the United States. It will be the largest project of its kind ever and currently has over 350,000 participants with the objective to improve care, diagnosis, and treatment for everyone based on individual data, takes into account your environment where you live, lifestyle, what you do, and your family health history and genetic makeup. So go to the All of Us site and sign up. Not only do you get to contribute to the largest of its kind ever individual care study, you get your own data back. So this is under the heading of things you also can do on a larger level, societal level. You can advocate for broadband internet access for everyone. Advocating for internet services as the fourth utility, and that means along with electricity, water, and gas. Internet access, according to visionaries, has long been called the fourth utility. The FCC has recently provided an interactive mapping tool, the Mapping Broadband Health in America site, to be used by local, state, and national planners to overlay and evaluate the intersection of health and broadband data. There are more things to watch for. The Biden administration is expected to prioritize health information and technology, including encouraging healthy exceptions to the information blocking rules as identified in the 21st Century Cures Act. We hope this means more interoperability to save our friend with the motor vehicle accident in ER, or it means more patient-centered exchange between environments of care. To assist in this respect, we hope to someday see an NPI, a National Patient Identifier. The algorithmic justice information, there is a 
organization committed to uncovering racial and gender bias in AI and popularized in the documentary Coded Bias. The Algorithmic Justice League harnesses people's stories of personal unfairness experienced by unjust algorithms, be they from endeavors of hiring, matters of forensics, or provision of medical care. Partnering with organizations of profile like TED, like Bloomberg, like Business, uh, Times, and Forbes, a major thrust of activity for all is to galvanize researchers, clinicians, and policymakers to harmful aspects of artificial intelligence such as biased algorithms. I want every nurse and doctor within range to work through their professional so society to make change. Do you know that very few professional societies, if any, have policies, procedures, or toolkits to help bridge the digital divide between you, you the provider, and their patients? But the provider can help their patient become an informed e-patient. Join a task force, make it happen. Propose intra-professional policy aimed at upskilling the workforce in the area of genetics and genomics nursing and precision health. These areas, by definition, involve digital health and the big data derived from it, and we are skeletal to that policy proposed to this year's American Nurses Association Convention this June. If it passes, this will be the first generalist practitioner society officially endorsing aspects of digital health. Lastly, here at Cal State San Bernardino, we have a motto. It's called Define the Future. Now it's time to go define your future. Define your health within that future, and that includes your digital health within your future. Be an e-patient.